Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Nikina Douglas Glenn, and I am the program co coordinator, the Eastern Area Program Co coordinator. And I am delighted that you all could join us this evening. I have the great pleasure of introducing our Eastern Area Program Coordinator, Anna Maria Bishop Harris. She hails from Jackson, Mississippi attended Howard University and the Fashion Institute of Technology. She is a member of the magnificent Metro Manhattan, New York chapter of the Lynx Incorporated. She has held a variety of leadership positions and I'd say she's probably having the most fun this year as program coordinator, bringing you a magnificent portfolio of programs. So without further ado, Please join me in welcoming Anna Maria Bishop Harris. Nikina, thank you for that marvelous introduction. I mean, yes, I have to carry you around with me all the time. That was quite gracious, and I truly do appreciate you. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us here this evening. This is 
the first in a series, actually the second in a series, of uh, New Year in 2022. First, we talked about health and wellness. Now we're going to go to financial fitness. The two go hand in hand. You can meditate all you want. You can eat all of the antioxidant-driven foods. You can exercise all you want. But let's face it, if your financial house is not in impeccable order, there is no way you will live a stress-free life. So that is what we brought you together here to talk about with a wonderful, wonderful message from DeAndre Salter about the culture of money. And it is truly a culture. So get ready to sit back and listen intently and proactively. And please, I encourage you, put your questions in the chat. We're looking for you. We're watching for you. And we want to hear you. And now it is my great privilege to introduce the lady who makes this Eastern Area train run so impeccably. She's a friend. She's my sister. Aside from that, I'm simply proud of the impeccable job she is doing. And I wouldn't say that if I didn't mean it. Ladies and gentlemen, our Eastern Area Director, Dr. Shawana Tucker. Thank you so much, Anna Maria, for your kind words. And truly, this is a team effort. And good evening. On behalf of the officers, leadership team, and over 4,600 members of the Eastern Area, I am very pleased to welcome you to New Year, New You, Financial Fitness with DeAndre Salter. The title of this evening's program really says it all. Total wellness of mind, body, and spirit has been part of our core focus here in the East since my administration began in 2019. Little did we realize then how in less than one year, we would be in the midst of a global pandemic, economic volatility, and intensified challenges for social and civil rights. All things which would test our wholeness in ways like never before. And that is why in the Eastern area, we declared when we entered this new year, we wanted all of our members to unleash their best selves by becoming a new you. As we all know, your best doesn't happen by accident. It takes intention and openness to learn and the courage to grow and do more than before. One important area of growth that will benefit ourselves, our families and our communities is increasing financial knowledge and expertise. It is an area where we as communities of color have consistently lagged and it has contributed to the cycle of disparities in income, wealth creation and transfer of wealth to generations to follow. This evening, we are all invest investing in our fiscal fitness as we spend time with our speaker, DeAndre Salter, author of The Culture of Money. We welcome DeAndre and look forward to his presentation. Thanks to our National Trends and Services Committee, chaired by Tanya Longino for putting this program together. And thanks to our Eastern Area Program Coordinator, Anna Maria Bishop Harris and Co-Coordinator Nakina Douglas Glenn for their leadership and delivery of innovative programming. In closing, we celebrate this year that we have been blessed to come this far by faith, strengthened by friendship and better equipped for service to our communities. Enjoy the evening and get ready to listen, learn, and put what you hear into action. Tanya will now present our speaker. Thank you, thank you. Thank you to our beloved area director, Shawana, Dr. Shawana Tucker Sims, and greetings to our area and national leadership. It is a privilege, it's my privilege to serve as the Eastern Area National Trends and Services Chair of the Lynx Incorporated. And tonight I am equally honored to share this space with our guest, financial expert, DeAndre Salter. Allow me a few moments just to share a little about him. He was born and raised in Newark, New Jersey. DeAndre Salter is a successful entrepreneur, financial educator, and author. Always hardworking and highly motivated. Salter earned his degree from Drew University in only three years, and upon graduation, 
joined the insurance industry as an underwriter and quickly found professional success. At the age of 21, he learned the difference between making money and building wealth, which ended with him filing bankruptcy. This caused him to take a hard look at himself and shift his behaviors to become a better person. After bankruptcy, he committed to pursuing God's plan to gain the world without losing his soul. Salter went on to build a stellar 20 year career as a senior vice president with three different Fortune 100 insurance companies. And his faith served as inspiration for building Professional Risk Solutions, a global insurance brokerage by the age of 30. Never losing sight of his relentless passion to help others to strengthen their faith, families and communities. Salter is now focusing on increasing wealth in black and brown communities by hosting workshops online and around the world. He believes the racial wealth gap is a sin and the impending wealth transfer is a tsunami that may wipe out black and brown people. Salter is a duly consecrated bishop in the Joint College of African American Pentecostal Bishops and the Macedonia International Bible Fellowship. He also serves as lead pastor of Impact Church of South Plainfield, New Jersey. He's been happily married to his childhood sweetheart, Terry, for over 25 years. Together, they have four children. He holds a Master of Theology from King's University and is pursuing his doctorate. He also serves on many boards, including a recent term on the Board of Trustees at his undergraduate alma mater, Drew University. Let's welcome DeAndre and let's get right to it. Hey, man, thank you so much for having me here. Thank you for being here with us. I, I won't take up too much time going on and talking because I know all of our readers out there, um, they want to know, they want to dig into your book as I have and as I have enjoyed. But first, I'm going to remind everyone to please put questions in the, the Q&A. The chat box has been disabled, so we have the Q&A open for you. I believe that's true. Our technology is reminding me of doing that. So please feel free to, to share your questions. We have a, a time period where we will take some of those questions and present them to DeAndre. So let's get to it. Let's get into it. And one of my first questions, and I'm sure for those who have been reading, you were bankrupt at 21 and a multimillionaire at 33. How did you turn that around? Let's talk about that. Oh, let's go to work. Before we do that, can I just thank you again? I want to thank Tanya Yu and Anna Marie Bishop, Nikina, and Dr. Shawana Tucker and the Links Incorporated for having me. Um, your question really gets to the heart uh, of the matter for me, for everyone, because your question, I think um, my answer will bring hope to somebody. I was bankrupt because of student loans. Mm -hmm. I mean, like many people, I was told that the only thing you need to do to progress in America, in America, is to get a good college education. What no one prepared me for is how expensive that college education would be, how it financed that college education. No one prepared me for, I didn't understand what credit card management was about. I didn't know that the first day on college or a week after college, I would go to my college mailbox and I would see credit card offers, even though I had no financial education. So between the credit card debt and, and living in credit card debt and, and accumulating student loans, um, my first job just didn't cover my expenses when I graduated college. Ultimately, you know, again, not being well financially, not well educated financially, I, I look for a way out. And so like anybody else, you see the ads in the newspapers, hey, we can clean your life up, bankruptcy, bankruptcy. But again, there's some education there that's needed. I didn't understand all the ins and outs of that. I didn't understand what bankruptcy would do to my credit long-term and my ability to rent an apartment or buy a car. So I made that decision. I made the decision to file bankruptcy. And I remember it like it was yesterday. Uh, I went to the bankruptcy court and you know, they read all of your assets out, Tanya, and they, they list everything you owe to who you owe it to. 
They list your credit history, how you paid your bills or not paid your bills. And then they, they list your net worth. So my net worth was negative. And I remember the bankruptcy judge saying at the time, he said, young man, do you know that you're worth less than nothing? He said that in a room full of people. My heart was broken. I had not, you know, I grew up in a church. So this is, you know, this is where you call yourself to, to your knees and you say, okay. look, I, I, I've studied, I, I, I've read all the books. I, I need a higher power. And it was in that moment of prayer that I really felt my heart shift and change. And I wanted to study myself and commit myself to a financial education. Like I needed to understand how I got here. Um, I, I, knew the, I knew the basics, but I needed to understand. Fast forward, um, what really happened was my career took off in the insurance, insurance industry. And I parlayed my underwriting success into entrepreneurial success. And I was able to take my 401k uh, that I worked you know, worked up over 10 years in the insurance industry as an underwriter, cash my 401k out, invested in opening up a sales brokerage for insurance. And after that, um, uh, I, I really shocked myself. I mean, I do know there was some divine hand at it, but there was some hard work and some intentionality. And after about, uh, you know, five years of doing my business plan, I was, uh, I was shocked. I, I, I closed the fifth year and realized that we had hit over $3 million in sales. Um, we, we had started to hire people. And the next thing I, I know is my accountant tells me, did you know that you are now officially by your net worth standards, a multimillionaire? I was floored. I was a young man, I didn't know. I didn't even know. I mean, I was so busy with my head down, Tanya, trying to, <laughs> trying to run away from that bankruptcy. Right. Uh, you know, when he gave me the, you know, I, look, I almost, you know, uh, did a dance right, right in his office. I was really excited about it. And from there, from there, we we're able to grow that business to become a global business, offices in Israel, offices all over the United States. We recently exited from that business, uh, my partners and I, and uh, that business did a tremendous thing for us. So that's really how I got out. It's one of the things I preach because I believe entrepreneurship mm -hmm. is, is one of the key ingredients that we need and that's really missing our community and not just sole proprietorship, but true entrepreneurship, well-capitalized businesses that can really help us create some long-term wealth. That was my way out. And, and I hope that that story is inspiring somebody else because, you know, student loans affects everybody, parents and students as well. It does. And I, I do thank you so much for sharing that story, because that for me and I'm sure others is a message for hope. Right. Because all of us who have been on college campuses as students, I, I remember so well opening the mailbox, as you said, and seeing all those credit card um, applications. And, you know, foolishly, I remember also signing up for some ridiculous pots and pans and China and all sorts of things that really, really were um, the impetus for derailing credit at a very young age. And so we just appreciate you sharing what you have um, because this book, um, and thank you for my copy. I appreciate that. I have a signed copy. So I hope, um, and we'll share with you how you too can get a copy if you've not already done so of DeAndre's book, because it is one of those reads that you won't put down because it is instructional. It is filled with, like I said, messages of hope, um, just like what you just shared, because that wasn't the end. That was, that was just the beginning. So thank you. So talk with us about the book and how you came to um, the, the title of the book, The Culture of Money. Why did that resonate so with you? Well, you know, when you think about Black culture, and one, one of the things I love about Black culture is that we certainly barter and broker a lot of influence. Um, when you look across the different cultural realms, I mean, when you think about our influence on food, all throughout every form of cuisine is our cooking. When you think about fashion and, and our fit and our drip, <laughs> <laughs> everyone wants to copy right? emulating yes everyone. Yeah, they want to emulate it they want yes. to do it they want to look like us our how we talk how we walk i mean how we carry ourselves our mannerisms um have been now adopted into the wider culture so we have mm. this great culture influence how we sing i mean from the singing in the church to singing in the club when we sing there's a sound there's a sound that Everybody wants to oh, replicate. Yes. Yeah, you feel it go through your bones. But Ooh. you know, when I thought about it, I said, you know, the one one of the areas where we really don't 
broker much of a cultural influence into the wider culture is an area of money. Historically, in this country, when we talk about money and Black people, it's usually a very negative connotation attached with that conversation. It's usually about what we don't have, what we don't do, um, how we have mismanaged or whatever mistakes we made or whatever poverty, uh, as if that is a descriptor for every Black American, uh, whatever poverty we're in. And I said, you know what, let's change the conversation. Let's shift the conversation. And we're great cultural influencers, you know, we, and we know how to do it. So if we can just, you know, get some principles to agree upon, we can use the same thing we've done in music and in food and in fashion and every other area of life, walk of life. And how about we shift the conversation to becoming about Black people being the culture of money? Mm -hmm. What if our culture is most identified with good wealth habits, good financial habits? That's why we came up with the title of the culture money. Very good, very good. We hear a lot, and you talk about this in the book, DeAndre, about the wealth gap. And that's something that's prevalent in, um, for all of us, right? We all talk about it, we read about it. They talk about it in schools and, and um, in the business schools, right? So we hear a lot about the wealth gap and the need to increase back black wealth like you just shared. So what role does the culture of money play in that discussion? Because you give us some tips on how to secure that. Let's talk about that. Well, first of all, um, and I don't wanna scare anybody here, but I have to use some really you know, clear language here. The wealth gap, it's really about the difference in, in terms of the average wealth of a white family compared to a black family. And depending on what study you look at, that number is somewhere between 10 to one or 13 to one, depending on the study that you look at. In other words, the average white family has 10 times more wealth than the average black family. And so that is the gap, that is the gap. Now, here's what's, here's what's bigger. Here's where we play a part. We're trying to sound the alarm family. We just, we, we, wanna, we wanna wake up uh, our people to realize that there is a potential black extinction event in our future. There's an extinction event. Here's what I mean by that. Wealth is usually transferred from one generation to another. And according to the most recent studies in about 25 years, nearly $68 trillion is going to transfer from one generation to another. How much of that wealth do you think will be transferring from one black generation to another black generation? I have a clue, it's 3%. If we don't do something, only 3% of Black Americans will be in that great wealth transfer. Now, to everybody who, who's here with us today, whether you're 20, 40, or 60, this affects you, right? Because wealth is competitive advantage in America. Mm -hmm. We live in a capitalistic society. So wealth uh, increases your access to education, increases your access to healthcare. So when we talk about wholeness and wellness, right? If all of a sudden, in 20, if I'm 20 years old today, in 25 years, I would be 45. And at 45, I'm now gonna have competitive disadvantage simply because of the birth lottery. <laughs> and my white counterparts may be inheriting a wealth transfer that is almost 10 times what I might inherit. So, so when I look at that and I look through that and I say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We need to, we need to wake up. We need to get serious about wealth. I'm glad to see many of our, um, Many of our celebrities and entertainers, folks in the music industry, in the hip hop industry, uh, athletes are now making, you know, uh, really getting, a, a, becoming part of the financial literacy movement. I'm really glad to see this wake up call for financial literacy because if you think about how big that wealth transfer is, 68 trillion, I call it a wealth tsunami. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a tsunami. I mean, that will wipe us out because if we think we have a disadvantage now in terms of wealth, well, if we fast forward it, there's going to be this, this, this great tsunami. And I'm really, really concerned because I love Black people. And I'm really, really concerned that we're not, we're not lifting our heads to, to see far enough down the road and what that impact might look like. So that's what the culture money is about. We're raising the alarm and really trying to bring personal finance from a Black perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, when you talk about the, the tsunami, and that is, that's startling to think about when you think about those numbers and you speak to why the financial literacy piece is so critical. Um, and I don't know that we fully get that, not all of us. And so 
Why do you think that's such a difficult concept, especially at an early age for some of us to grasp? Well, I think number one, I mean, great question. Um, first of all, we don't teach financial literacy in schools, mm -hmm. uh, at least in most schools, some, some, some are trying. And even when you look at the you know, secondary uh, education and even uh, you know, uh, graduate education, very little is talked about in the area of financial literacy. So what we have are people who are learning about money uh, through experience and those who they're exposed to. Herein lies the problem. What if I'm not exposed mm -hmm. to the social circles of people who are great with money? What if my only role models, what if the richest people that I knew were not great with money? Or what if the richest people I knew weren't rich at all? What, what if it was manufactured wealth? Mm -hmm. What if it looked good on the outside, mm -hmm. but the bank account didn't back up mm -hmm. what we saw? And that's what I saw, and that was my influence. Then likewise, I'm gonna repeat some of the negative potential financial behaviors that, that I was exposed to. And so I think, I think this is a major issue, A, because we don't teach it in school, and thus, within, and especially within our community, um, we're don't, we don't always have access to the role models, uh, the financial role models that would help us learn these things. Now, some generations back, we certainly had it. Uh, I'm, I, I'm floored the more research I do on how Black folks manage their money prior to 1950. Prior to 1950, watch this, with less education, no social media, no internet, no TikTok, no, no YouTube videos to watch, barely mm -hmm. could go to a library without being harassed. Mm -hmm. You know the simple principle that our people had? I'm gonna save my money, I'm gonna buy a piece of real estate, I'm gonna own some property, I'm gonna pay that property off, and I'm gonna hand that property down to my children. That was the fundamental viewpoint. And that's one of the principles that you talk about um, in your book. And I want us to, those values, those three core values that you talk about, um, especially in our community. Um, I don't wanna give them away, um, <laughs> but I, you know, I put some sticky notes in the book behind it because that own more, know more and pass down more, that's, that's really, that, that really hit me. Can you talk a little bit about why you chose that? Right, so if we're gonna, right, so here's what culture is. When we really mm -hmm. think about culture, culture is really our values, right? It's mm -hmm. what we value. And so uh, we value, uh, we value the way somebody cooks a certain dish. Mm -hmm. And at Thanksgiving, we all know who's gonna cook the macaroni and cheese, right? We, we assign that dish to some big why, because we value that. And so likewise, when it comes to money, if we're gonna have, uh, if we're going to have any inroads on this wealth gap issue and create more black wealth, we really have to have some agreed upon shared values that are community wide mm -hmm. and that are easily um, understood. And so what I've come up with are the three simple values that I think are their ancestral, really. As I said, if you go back prior to 1950, these were the values. So I wouldn't say I created them. I'm just rearticulating them for our age and all our age groups. But they are no more, own more and pass down more. Mm -hmm. It's a simplistic way of talking about the need for agreeing upon financial literacy being important in our community, ownership being important in our community, and legacy being important in our community, right? But here's the thing, Tanya, that, that I really love about them, their values are progressive. So in other words, the reason why they're, they're linked together is they're progressive. If you go from the reverse, well, we can't really pass down what we don't own. You have to have assets to pass down. And we can't get in ownership positions unless we increase our, the information that we're digesting and the application of information. So we must increase our financial capabilities by increasing our financial knowledge, our financial literacy. So thus they're successive, they're progressive. If we know more, we can own more. If we own more, we can pass down more. So you're preaching now. I hear, I hear, I hear some, some preaching going on behind that. I do. But that's, um, that's something that I'm going to put above my computer because I think that's important. And I invited my three children to join us tonight because I wanted them, they're young adults, uh, 23, 22, and 19. So I, I hope they are in the virtual audience somewhere because there's a quiz behind this, our session tonight. So hopefully they are listening. 
So let's talk a little bit about the pledge that you have on the website, DeAndre. You have a pledge there. And I want you to talk a little bit about that for our audience. Well, I want a million Black people to sign the pledge. It's a digital pledge and it's simple. You see, we need to move, and I, and I, I think it was Dr. Shiana who said it earlier about being intentional, mm -hmm. right? So intentionality mm -hmm. is very important if we want to shift. So what happened with me in bankruptcy, and the reason I went through personal examination is most of what we talk about are outcomes, but not behaviors. Um, we can't control um, our outcomes, but we can always control our behaviors. So what we're trying to do is shift behaviors because um, behaviors are what, what will give us better outcomes. Better behaviors give us better chance at better outcomes. So the pledge is, is, is an easy first step that everyone can take. And what is the pledge? We're pledging to know more, to, mm -hmm. to take financial literacy seriously. And that pledge looks as simple as reading three to four financial, uh, personal finance articles a week. And if you don't understand those articles, to write the terms and the definitions down and to go to a place like Investopedia and, and look up those terms. Investopedia.com is my financial Bible. When I want, it's my dictionary. So when I want to know something, I go there. The second piece of that pledge is to, to commit to ownership. And, and ownership for us are three things. We, we want Black people to own more, more equity, be more involved in the stock market, but we also want Black people to own more property um, and, and appreciating assets, such as property and fine art. And we really want Black people to own even more businesses than we own. Now, Black women have done a tremendous job uh, mm -hmm. in the community, particularly if you look at the last 10 years, Black women are out there killing it in terms of business ownership. But the issue that Black women businesses are, are having is access to capital mm -hmm. and, and scalability, right? So we don't just want to own more sole proprietorships because 97% of Black-owned businesses are sole proprietorships. So that's a great start, but we really need to build businesses that we can scale and sell because the wealth is created when you exit from a business. And by being a founder and exiting from a business, you get capital. So we want people to pledge that, you know, to, to, to own more. And then thirdly, pledge for legacy. I mean, I don't care if you're 20 or 40, again, or 60, legacy is important, right? So it, when, I, when I talk about that, Many people think, sometimes I get younger folks in the audience and they'll say, oh, well, I don't have any children. I don't know if I'm gonna have any children. But do you know if you want a legacy? Like, mm. do you know if you want your values to translate to whatever cause you're interested in or to whatever business you wanna build? So everybody has legacy, right? And the key is we want something to feed that legacy. So that's really what the pledge is. You can go to theculturemoney.com and take the pledge. And I would, I would love to get a million people to do that. We're making strides. We have some way to go, but we're going to get to that million. Take it. I like it. This slide that's up for everyone who's watching, um, please take a screenshot of it because um, DeAndre puts how you can connect with him on Instagram and, and how to um, educate yourself. And I'm hoping that we can drop in the chat you talked about investopedia.com um, and maybe we can drop that in the chat for those who are joining us, especially because if it's investopedia.com is your Bible for investments and finances, it ought to be ours too. So let's put that in the chat so that we can all um, follow it. You just talked about something when you said legacy and I made a note um, to myself, um, you will leave a legacy one way or the other. Uh, I'm paraphrasing um, in your book, but that one also struck me. Share with us a little bit about what you meant by that, one way or the other. Well, you see, it's it's about being intentional again. I mean, there are a lot of accidental legacies being <laughs> left behind. You know, accidental legacies leave us to um, do GoFundMe funeral raises. Mm. That's because of accidental legacy. And that hurts my heart, mm -hmm. you know, working in a community as a pastor for over 16 years, uh, one of the sad things um, I see are funerals. And I see these acts into legacies where there were no planning uh, involved um, for what would happen uh, post that person's departure. But no, you're gonna leave a legacy. And I think legacy is important, right? Because when we think about legacy, here, here, here's, here's the, the low hanging fruit for everybody. We automatically think about money, right? and assets and wealth. But legacy actually begins with values. And that's why 
we have those three values, right? Because if you pass down money to a generation, a cause, a, a, a business uh, that survives you, and you pass that business down or you, to another owner or partner, or you pass wealth down to your children, they don't share your values, then the legacy really won't continue, right? Mm -hmm. So where we really begin with is we need the same vision and we need the same values. And if we're intentional about having these money conversations, you know, Tanya, one of the things that, that has really blessed us in our home is my children, I have, I have four children, three of them are in their 20s, um, between 21 and 25, and I have a 16 year old. Every Monday night, I cook a meal. We have a Sabbath, right? Monday's the Sabbath in our house. Uh, it's, it's where we just sabbatical together. I cook a fresh meal from scratch. We sit around the table, no TV, no music. You know, we just talk. I mean, maybe some music, but no phones, no devices. And, you know, we talk a lot about money. We talk about wealth. We talk about jobs. And what I'm trying to do in those, on the, in those Monday meetings are really translate for them and communicate to them my heart. Mm. You know, what is my heart for your future? What is my heart for this family? You know, what kind of vision do you have? How can I help set you up and build a platform for that vision? And what kind of financial moves do we need to make as a family to make your dream come true in the values that we all agree upon? Because if we share those values and we share that vision, then sharing the money becomes easy. So yes, we don't want accidental legacies where there was no planning and there's no intentionality. We want intentional legacies and that just requires us to have more money conversations. We just have to get more comfortable talking about money. And, and the wonderful thing is what I'm hearing is that you have started early. You started early with your children. Um, so this will become a part of who they are and um, an expectation. You've built an expectation with them around the importance of it and shared values and um, those shared tenants as a family. And don't think I, I, I missed the part about you preparing the, the home cooked meal that didn't fall um, light to my ears. So I also invited my spouse. So he's here too, somewhere <laughs> in, the, in the audience. Um, DeAndre, you are a man of faith. And um, what do you believe is God's will for Black people and their legacies? I can't say it enough. Um, my fundamental view of God is that he loves his children. He loves his creation like a parent who, who makes a child and creates a child, there's, there's a bond between us. And, and when I read scripture, my lens of scripture is very clear. The New Testament apostle John says to a church he's writing to, I pray that God will bless you in health, wellness, and prosperity, that you'll be blessed in all things. So, you know, from the New to the Old Testament, I think the fundamental view of God for us is not that all will be blessed, but it is his heart that we will be blessed. One of the areas where I think there is a great opportunity for people like me, pastors, um, to really take a leadership role and bring in financial healing in our communities. You know, and I really think that God would love for churches to become more active and involved in financial ministries. Mm -hmm. I think it's needed. I think rather than building buildings, we should build people. Mm -hmm. I think we should, you know, build people because if we build bigger people, then we can build bigger buildings to fit more people to build more people. And so I, you know, we need to progress our conversation in in the in, in, as people of faith beyond just giving and beyond stewardship, but we need to be having like incubator funds coming through churches. We need to have startup competitions in churches. We need to have business ministries and churches. I'm throwing out some ideas. If you're a pastor mm -hmm. here and you're listening, grab one of these. You know, business, business colloquiums where we're, we're bringing in speakers and trainers. We need to have financial education classes as part of our financial discipleship ministries because I believe all of these are the heart of God. And finally, the last thing I'll say about that, and thank you so much for asking me as a man of faith that question. When I look at Jesus's ministry, mm -hmm. he was certainly ministering to those that did not have as much. And one of the things that he did really well is he went to the affluent class, challenged them to invest in all the classes. And that's where I think we need to go right now. I think that's God's heart. Yeah, that was a word. That was a word for, um, for all of us. So I want to um, move us to some of the questions 
in the Q and A in our chat box because I see it filling up. If that's okay with you, is that good? Let's go to work. Let's go to work. So let's see. And I'm just going to start with uh, one of the first ones I see. Um, other than a strong prayer life, what techniques did you use to trust your business colleagues and those who were responsible for your finances? Whoever asked that question, I love you already. I love you already. <laughs> You're question. on it. Yeah. Now, it's a great question. Now I'm gonna teach you something. That I want everybody to remember this. Um, so, I, so I built the business and I need you to understand the scale of it so you'll understand what, what I'm about to tell you. I started the business in my living room. I, I graduated after I achieved enough revenue to a home office. <laughs> And I remember the first day I had to fake it till I made it. Remember the first day I opened up a customer call and I pretended that I was an assistant for myself. And I said, hello, welcome to Professional Risk Solutions. This is, this is uh, a Professional Risk Solutions, how can I help you? And the gentleman who knew me a long time as an underwriting in the insurance industry, he, put, he, put, he played along. He said, well, may I speak to DeAndre? I said, well, hold on, let me see if he's available. I tapped the phone down on the table to make it, you know, because I want to sound like I had a big phone system where you had to click over and transfer. So I just tapped it down softly on the table. And, and then I picked up and I changed my voice to say, hi, this is DeAndre, how can I help you? And a second later, a gentleman named Robert Colburn, he laughed. He said, I know it's you, man. I know it's you. I tell you that story to say this. I went from that to have an off, a staff and a team in India, a staff and a team in Israel, acquiring offices in books of business in Baltimore, books of business in Tampa, Florida, West Palm Beach, Florida, um, the West Coast, Boston, and our headquarters in New York. I, I was the professional solutions was the largest black owned insurance, commercial insurance brokerage in the world. Okay, so we placed over $100 million in, in contracts on an annual basis. And here's what I learned to answer that question in a very long way. The most important number I had to learn was one, because as long as I had one more share mm -hmm. than every one of my partners, then I still had control because 51% is control. And so what I had to learn to do to build and scale my business from my home office to get to that kind of multinational presence was I had to learn how to share the wealth. I had to learn how to incentivize people and share the equity. Mm -hmm. And when, so it's one thing to have the vision, but it's a, you have to learn to trust people. And you have to trust them. Now, you, you can't trust everybody. You can't share equity with dead weight because that just creates a negative marriage, a negative marriage in business. And you need to find, you need to share the equity with people that can help you drive the revenue. Mm -hmm. And with those people, be generous to share the equity because the only thing you need to worry about is one. As long as you own 51%, you still stay in control, which means you can still vote them out. You can still, depending on how your bylaws are set up, mine was always set up by majority. Mm -hmm. And at 51, I was always majority. Mm -hmm. So, and there were partners along the way that we had to exit from the business, that we had to, you know, buy them out or others where we, we had to ask to find another opportunity. Certainly those things happen. That's part of the risk of business. It won't always work out, but you need to be able to get people in your dream because as long as you're the only one carrying that dream, it's always going to be too big for you. It's always going to be too big. You need help. That's great advice. Thank you. And, and thank you for the question as well. You have another. The home ownership rate for Black Americans today is lower than it was in 1968. What can we do to encourage sustainable property ownership? Another great question. You guys are really killing it tonight. Um, one of the things I talk about in the culture of money, and here's, here's a strategy that I've used. Here's a strategy I teach in my church, and it's a strategy that um, I recommend everybody use. I believe one of the ways to tackle home ownership, particularly with the increasing values on home, the real estate values, and now we're in an increasing rate environment. So thus the cost of borrowing is gonna increase um, considerably in the, in the next few years. I think one of the solutions we should use is pooling of resources. Mm. You know, again, it's almost like the last question. It's a back to partnership. You, you have to do it with people you trust, but I think we need to think wider than family. I think we ought to start looking at uh, property ownership, almost like business ownership, mm -hmm. looking at it like a business partnership. And there's no reason why two or three friends cannot 
you know, put a legal agreement together, form an LLC, put an operating agreement together that talks about what we'll do with the proceeds, what we do we sell if somebody wants to cash out of their percentage of the equity. But that's another way to get about it in terms of shared living arrangements or just even from an investment standpoint, maybe three partners buy the house. One of the individuals, I, I know a group of people, three bought a house, one lived in a house, paid rent back to the partnership. It covered the note and the mortgage, but the property appreciated. They sold the property some years later and then were able to split the proceeds. So, you know, they needed a house, but they found two partners who were willing to invest in the house. So pooling of resources is really how we're going to make a dent in it because some, you know, sometimes it's really hard to come up with the cash for down payments and it's really hard to get the financing. But by pooling our resources together, we can get more yeah, than we can on our own. Great. Thank you. And thank you for the question. An anonymous attendee says, I love what I'm hearing, but I'm aware that our communities of color live in constant trauma. Some of this may be by design. Hmm. This distraction keeps them focused on day-to-day -day survival. One of the things I believe is that the behaviors can shift if we address the inequities in basic needs. Would you agree? Anonymous attendee, I'm going to send you an offering. I need your address because you're preaching right now. Yes. I mean, you are. You, you, yep. you hit it out the ballpark. So we can't have this conversation about Black people and wealth without addressing the obvious elephant in the room. Many people always ask me, are you for reparations? Yes, I am for reparations. Am I waiting on it? No. Mm -mm. I'm working while I'm waiting. <laughs> Because so so certainly there are inequities, right? We we have we have systematic discrimination in lending still, and now we see that it's become very public about even on appraisal values, there is yes. discrimination on appraisal values. Uh, I come out of the private equity world. I'm an angel investor, and and I'm always having conversations in that world about the lack of funding for Black founders, uh, particularly Black female founders, is almost non-existent. Okay, so raising capital is a challenge. So all these are systematic inequities. And so I certainly do, you know, while I say there's things we can do and shift behaviors, we do need to address systematic inequities, but some of that is gonna be addressed through public policy, very little of it through corporate responsibility. I mean, listen, after 2020, we saw billions of dollars pledged and very little of it making a dent or doing anything. We can't even track it, right? It was for the PR moment. Mm -hmm. So corporate responsibility has a part to play, but, but unless we get people of color in positions of power who are willing to speak, when they have the platform and take their authority to do so, to challenge those corporate systems, they're gonna have the least part of play. But I think where we can make some real movement is public policy. I'm for universal basic income. Mm -hmm. Somebody asked me, well, why are you for UBS? I said, well, if I have children that are leaving my house, and if you're 20 today and you're leaving a house, it's pretty expensive mm -hmm. in most parts of the country. It's pretty yeah. expensive to be a 20 year old. If you're leaving the house and you have college debt and you're trying to, so they need support. So if I, if I would support my own children, why would not I support the wider community? So I certainly believe we need a universal basic income to address some of these inequities. Great. And, and, and uh, the, the anonymous uh, question, I know where it came from. So she says, thank you. <laughs> you, you hit the <laughs> nail on the head there. Um, what steps should be taken in advance for and by our children and grandchildren who have the desire to attend college? Uh-oh, I just lost that question. I'm sure it's gonna come back to me. Who have the desire to attend college? Is the student loan option all that is available to them or us as parents? Um, so the two things I would say about that, number one, uh, let's have a frank conversation about the cost of education. So having sat uh, on uh, boards, um, the university boards, I understand how they work, mm -hmm. how they're priced, how the product is priced. And I'll just tell you what I, what I said as a trustee, college is just too expensive. Mm -hmm. And the return on investment is not what it used to be. So the first thing I would challenge us to think about is let's first wrestle with, does every child need a college education? I know that sounds controversial, but some, some of our children may already be showing the proclivity to be great entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and may need to go into business or mm -hmm. startup or professional services or as an independent contractor, right? Bar bartering their skills. 
I mean, I've seen some kids with some design skills and they're 18 years old coming out of high school and they're ridiculous already. And they can make NFTs and yeah. they understand how to do that. So I think we need to embrace that. The second question I think we need to look at is does everybody need to go to an expensive four year university for four years? And what I always am a proponent of is a lower cost community college education for two years and then transfer in to finish out your four year degree at maybe that more expensive institution. Because what that shows is typically you can cut the cost you know, of college down by almost you know, 45 to 50% mm -hmm. by doing a junior college first and then going to college for four years. That also gives that child some another year or two for maturity, right? To just mature and understand the value. Because let's be real, if our children aren't convinced they should go to college and they're going just to appease us and please us, that's a significant investment to make for some seeds. Yeah, I'm not no, willing no. to do it. No. <laughs> no, and I'm not either. I mean, I had that conversation tell you with my children. I, every single one of them, when they graduate high school, is like, do you want to start a business or do you want to go to college? I'm going to start, I'm going to help you. Or do you want to go into the workforce? And if you go to college, there's a standard we need to meet. And if you're not meeting that yet, think about that community college route. And I'm going to come alongside you after that. So I, I think we need to think more along of those routes. The third thing I'll say is the last thing is this. Um, and I didn't understand this until I got involved in philanthropy. There's billions of dollars and grant money and scholarships that go untapped. Yeah. Nobody's applying for them. One of the biggest aches I've found in the philanthropic community is they, they have money to give away, but nobody wants it. And I, I thought they were lying until I saw the numbers. And I'm like, wait a minute, you have millions of dollars to give away, but no one's applying for the scholarships, maybe because the paperwork is too much or whatever. But, you know, I think so maybe there's some resources we could bring there to help people access those monies that may also lower the cost of education. That was good. I have time for one more question. And um, this is, uh, you touched on this a little bit um, when we were initially talking. How do I get started with investing? How do you get started with investing and you have no knowledge? I have a 401k, but I do not, but I don't know what I'm doing because I lost my job when COVID hit and all I have is just the 401 sitting. Everything we just talked about, COVID made worse, just like <laughs> everything else. Uh, you know, um, COVID certainly decimated um, the Black community, not just in terms of health, but in terms of wealth as well. But what I recommend for beginner investors is, first of all, let's not skip over Investopedia, the culture of money, and all those financial resources and tools that our ancestors did not have access to. So I think we need to build our financial confidence and um, money is easier to understand than high school math. And high school math is pretty hard these days. So money is a lot easier and we won't get better at it until we are intentional about reading and becoming well-read in terms of uh, personal finance and literature. So that's the first thing. The second thing I would say is once you, once you feel confident, you have a basic understanding I think you need a financial advisor. A lot of people think you need a lot of money to have financial advisors. You don't. If you're 20 right now and 21, you're graduating college, the first thing you should do while you apply for a job is get a financial advisor, mm -hmm. all right? And there are now low cost financial advisors available online, robo advisors, companies like Betterment, companies like Wealthfront, companies like Personal Capital. Um, I'm big fans, um, have invested in some of these companies. Um, these are great companies because no matter what your amount of wealth is, you can access someone to help you manage money for you. And so I think until you build your own financial capabilities, the best thing you can do is to work with a professional accredited financial advisor to help you do that. Thirdly, here's the third option. And if you don't trust, because again, you may have a trust issue and, and that's fine. I'm not here to judge it. But what I will tell you to do is, you know, learn to do some research and you need to invest in what is called maybe ETFs. ETFs are exchange traded funds. These are basically, you know, a portfolio of stocks that are picked by a manager. They're grouped together to do the picking for you. Uh, and you can buy them by sector. You can buy them by either US sector, international or by industry sector um, or by strategy. You can buy, you know, small cap companies, meaning companies under a certain revenue size 
or large cap, you know, the blue chips like Apple and Tesla, and you just buy ETFs, mm -hmm. and let the ETF fund managers manage for you. And thus you can still be investing with a low level of financial confidence as you build, but you're still able to grow your assets in the marketplace. So those are some strategies I would consider. DeAndre, we have more questions in the Q&A in the chat than um, we have time for this evening. And um, we have several questions around, will this be available? Will this conversation be available um, for recording? And we are recording and I'm, I'm almost 98.9% .9 sure that it'll be on our Eastern Area website, the recording for those who have asked. Um, where can people buy your book, The Culture of Money, and how can they find out more about building Black wealth? Well, you can go to theculturemoney.com. You can visit any of your bookstores, uh, Barnes and Nobles, um, anywhere you buy books online, you can get The Culture of Money. Uh, we're soon to release a, a workbook and a small group guide so that if you have, like you want to do it with your kids, and you want to go through the book with your kids, we have a, we have a guide that's going to be released really soon on our website to help you do that. Or, if you, or just friends, you just want to have a, a book club and friends. So we, we're going to have that tool available. But in addition to that, I would really suggest you go to theculturebuddy.com and sign up for our mailing list or take the pledge. Because what we'll do there is share with you information that we know will help you. And everything we write is from a Black perspective, unapologetically. Um, and so, you know, you're going to be able to get things in your inbox. They're going to help you figure out. We have an article on our website about pooling, talk to you about how to do that, how to lend money to friends, how to borrow money from friends, how to do it the right way. Just things that we know will be a blessing to you. So feel free to stop by theculturemoney.com. We love you to be part of our family. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, DeAndre, just, just a couple words from you, because I know that we have young people that have joined us tonight. We invited um, students from our HBCUs to join us. And there were several questions or several comments in the chat box about uh, what would you tell your younger self um, today? What would you say to your younger self? And speak to those young people who are with us this evening. What I would tell my younger self is don't live for other people. Mm. Live for my truth. And I would tell my younger self, don't talk about it, be about it, DeAndre. I dreamed of being successful. I just I wasn't willing to make the commitment at 21 and 20 yeah. and I had to grow into that commitment. So I've had a chance to go back in time and smack him in the face. I would say, be true. You say you want to be rich. You say you want to be wealthy. Start acting like you have money before you have it. Don't just talk about it, be about it. That's DeAndre, it. thank you. It's been a joy um, and an opportunity for learning, not just for myself, but for all who joined us to be with you. And it's not over because we can um, get the book. There's so many uh, resources that you share in the book, some of your, your personal ones. Um, we dropped some in the chat for those who are interested in following some of what you shared with us. Before turning over the program to um, our area coordinator, I just wanted to share that Our Money Matters in partnership with the HBCU Community Development Action Coalition is a self-paced virtual literacy, financial literacy learning opportunity. And no matter where you are in terms of your financial knowledge, Our Money Matters can take you to the next level or wherever you're striving to achieve. DeAndre, thank you so much for your time and your commitment and sharing of your knowledge. We so appreciate you and all that you shared. And I'm going to turn the virtual mic over now to our area coordinator, Anna Maria. Thank you. Thank you and God bless. God bless. Tanya, thank you for doing a yeoman's job this evening. As always, you are grateful, composed, and spectacular. DeAndre, you have shared so much with us. And I am eternally grateful because I'm one of those people that gets a little skittish when finances come up. I'll be very candid about that. But you made me feel at ease and comfortable, and I learned a lot. I truly learned a lot this evening. You shared some words that resonated with me. Value. Legacy. These are very, very important. And we all 
need to take those words into account when we plan our finances, when we plan our lives. Sir, you were engaging, and I congratulate and celebrate you. I want to thank, as always, our communications and technology team who undergird us in every way and do a phenomenal job. And finally, I'd like to share a few words that my grandfather, my beloved grandfather, always said to me. Live below your means and you will always be free. Sometimes when I want to go out and splurge, I literally hear his voice. And it calms me down and makes me make a, a wise decision, a prudent decision, as opposed to a decision driven by impulse. I want to thank my friend my beautiful area director, Shawana, because oftentimes she calms me down too. Uh, Shawana, I think you will recall one day when we had done some very, very, very wise shopping. We had gone shopping at a sample sale. But then I got an impulse and you stopped me dead in my tracks. And I want to thank you for that. You've got to have friends that help you, that know you, and who balance you. And finally, finally, the best way to stay and a good financial place is to be grateful for what you got. Thank you for joining us. Madam Director, do you have any final words, my dear? I just want to say thank you to DeAndre for sharing his wisdom with us this evening. This was really excellent, and we look forward to continue working with you and hearing from you in the future. We appreciate it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, stay grateful, have the attitude of gratitude, and you will flourish. Thank you.
brothers and sisters, you can stay.